Chapter 29 The white clouds descended. Thick as milk, they descended. Whatever they touched turned to powder or ooze. Limestone sloughed down in runnels of ash. Basalt crumbed like soggy cake. Clay rooftops melted. Brick walls slumped in yellow dust. Wood simply evaporated. People, running, shrieking, scrambling people, became skeletons that ran on a few steps before the bones lost volition, and the joints separated and all tumbled toward the ground, but dissolved before they could strike cobbles that too dissolved. People died. They died in Halcyon as certainly as they died on the desert plains below. They would die in Losanon too, when Wrath did not receive the unconditional surrender it demanded, and in Wington and Seton and all the others. Within a week, the whole empire would turn to white memory. Halcytes fled toward Phyrexia. They went like rats scurrying away from a sudden, bright light. Panting and shrieking, they flung themselves down any hole that presented itself. Some were death traps, wells and cisterns. Clouds billowed into them and ate away whomever hid within and brought walls and ceilings something after. Other holes, the ones that stank of sewage or sulfur, they fled down into a fetid, welcoming darkness. The putrid air was redolent with life, or at least the leavings of life, a glad smell when one is persuaded by white, cleansing death. Rats headed downward as well. Rats and dwarves, toads and lizardmen, alley cats and cat people, vermin, thydex, goblins, and elves. Thick-browed barbarians and minotaurs, they all need to run down into the darkness. Foes who would have slit each other's throats in the gleaming city now ran side by side through the murk. They followed each other's makeshift torches, climbed down the ways that others had proved safe, skirted the pits where folk had fallen. They did not slay each other, but they did not save each other. They would happily follow a sure-footed minotaur down a slick channel and just happily climb over his corpse, wedged in a ruined sluice. The divisions of nation and city-state, of race and gender, dissolved. It was not a mad throng, but tens of thousands of mad individuals flooding away from light and down into darkness. In time, all those winding channels led to great cesspits. Those had doors to furthest descent, which led exonerably to the manor rig. Gargantuan furnaces, enormous crystals, inexplicable machines, but no doors, only coal chutes and blazing ovens. The refugees arrived and moiled and flooded, water desperate to find a path downward. Perhaps there was no path downward. Perhaps they would all be crushed against the furnaces, and the air would be breathed up, and the white death would blanket them all. Then a voice spoke. It came from everywhere and nowhere at once. It echoed in unseeable heights and in the chambers of terrified hearts, the voice of Yawmoth. People of Halcyon, people of the allied foes, hear me. Even now, a wave of death settles over all we have built. It draws the power from every crystal that held our nation aloft. Towers fall, walls crumble, the dream of Halcyon is over. We have seen the Thran Temple fall. We have seen the walls of our city turn to ash and sift away. This cloud will course down the channels that have brought us here. It will reach even the deepest spot and supercharge the 81 crystal spheres here. They will explode with a force that will level the whole extrusion. A groan of terror rose from the moiling multitude. Fingernails clawed at any crack that might be a doorway. The voice of Yalmoth came again. The throng quieted beneath its mesmeric balm. It should be a time for utter despair. The dream is over. All is lost, but not all. I have prepared a perfect place for you. A world beyond illness and death beyond war and plagues and famines. Oh, my people, I have longed to bring you to paradise. The aching compassion in his voice swept like a black wind through the chamber. The people breathed it in. Their lungs tingled, and their hearts forgot panic. Let me tell you of this land, of Phyrexia. Its entryway lies deep in bedrock, and the world itself exists in a place not of this place. It will never be destroyed. It is a bountainous world, with wide and fertile plains, golden with wide grain and rich and primeval game, and deep in black earth. There is an endless farmland for any who would work the soil and bring forth its fruits. Above are the Plain Tower Mountains, snow-capped and robin ancient woodlands. Below stretch deep jungles as impenetrable and festant as the forests of Jamura. And lakes. Yes. And oceans. Yes. And growing cities of design more glorious than all the cities of the Empire. Each word set a bright image floating in the darkness. I have prepared this place for you, my people. Even for you, my one-time foes, I have made it for you, for I am a god. I ask only that you enter it. I ask only that I may be your god. Suddenly, there was movement in the deepest, darkest corner of the manor rig. There came a grating rumble. Massive blocks slid back. A great blackness opened in the wall. Already the stall throng shifted and flooded down into it. There. The invitation is given. The way is open. I am the way. Receive me and enter into paradise. They did. Every last creature opened his or her solitary heart to Yawmoth, and he entered them. There was no longer solitary, for Yawmoth dwelt within. Ones became twos, 
and twos became fours and eights until they all were a mad nation. Wait, Rebecca told the goblins, whose claws fidgeted at the ends of the healing capsule. They were anxious to join the procession out of the manor rig and down into Phyrexia. Rebecca grasped the healing capsule and forcefully pushed it down. Wait, we can't carry this through that press. Wait until the way clears a bit. The truth was, she was in no hurry to reach Phyrexia. She half hoped the cloud would catch her here. Open it, she found herself saying. The goblins looked at her in consternation and surprise. One piped. No time. We flee now. Open it, Rebecca repeated. I want to see my husband's face. Scowling, the goblins complied. They were good creatures, most steadfast than any human she had ever met and more clever than half of them. They understood her husband like no one else, even better than she. My goblins, Glaceon had called them, with the same tone of voice a man would use to say my friends. Claw slid beneath the lid of the capsule, and the goblins pushed it open. Rebecca leaned over the capsule, knowing even before she saw. Glaceon lay absolutely still. His chest did not rise and fall. The breathing mechanism was quiet. Its power stone driver had been knocked loose. It lay beside Glaceon's still face. Rebecca touched him. His body was cold, as cold as the stone beneath her. His skin was pale as bone. Her hand ran across eyelids that for years had clenched in pain, for she kissed him now and realized she had not kissed her own husband since Yawgmoth had arrived, were cold and beginning to stiffen. Master Glaceon? A goblin said, jiggling the man's leg. Master Glaceon? It's too late, Rebecca said. The sound was empty in her mouth. Oh, Master Glaceon, Ugh. he was a good man, the goblin cooed. Rebecca nodded. He had been trapped in a fuming building for years, and now at last it has collapsed on top of him and burned him up. Too late for Master. The youngest goblin piped up. Not for us! Not too late for us! We leave him here! We can go! Yes, Rebecca responded. Leave him here. You can go. The young creature gave an anxious leap and dashed away into the shouldering horde. Two of the others followed, bowing in respect to Rebecca before they disappeared. The final goblin lingered a moment. You coming? Rebecca shook her head. Nodding sadly, the goblin turned to go. In three steps, he merged with the Black River of Refugees. Rebecca took a deep breath of the stale air, the smell of herded humanity. All too soon, she would be alone forever. Already, she was alone forever. It was a torturous route down the Caves of the Damned. There was little light and much death. Folks stepped away from blind cliffs or struck their heads on stalactites. Always, the next in line forged ahead. They trode first in the bodies of the fallen. The leaders led and died. Those behind pressed forward with desperate weight. At long last, they reached the bottom. Houseite guards guided them. What a glad sight were those silver-armored warriors. Now the way would be clear. Now, no one else had to die. At the heels of the quick marching guard, the refugees swept down through the caves. They reached the great cavern that had once held untouchable noble houses. Now the cavern bore no memory of them. It had been cleansed by Yalmoth's touch. Only insectile machines filled the spot, guardians on either side of the glimmering, inviting portal. Laughter mixed with hoots of joy. Songs rose among the refugees. They were old songs that spoke of the founding of the empire, of the beautiful and plentiful land that awaited those bold enough to enter. These folk were bold. They marched behind bobbing helmets, Yalmoth's nation. They neared the portal. Sunlight streamed through. Between helmets, there were glimpses of verdant forests, vast plains, gray mountains, even a city of elegantly sloping roof lines. In a sudden rush, they were through the sunlight of a new world. It was vast and beautiful. The way was long with expert house guards. Troops stood, rank on rank, to the verges of the forest below and in the middle of the plain above. Behind the wall of silver armor was armor of a different sort, embedded in skin and muscle. Perhaps it was a metal plate or perhaps modified bone. Whatever, it forced the skin out in ridges and lines. The soldiers there had alterations, horns poking from shoulders, claws grafted on where once human hands had been, metal implants sewn into separating wounds. The song died on the refugees' lips. Some tried to turn back. Those behind, craning on a view of a new world, forced them onward. Just ahead waited the savior Yawmoth, the god Yawmoth, surrounded by his hideous creatures. He opened his hands expansively. Welcome, my children. Welcome to Phyrexia.